Greetings, everyone. It is so wonderful to be in this space uh, with everyone today. Um, if you're like me, this is uh, this is day two of participation in the Living Liberation Conference for you. And also, if you're like me, um, there's no place you would rather be. It's been um, well, it's been a, a rough several decades, but particularly um, a really um, a really fraught uh, past few weeks and months, right? Um, many of us are in rapid response mode. Um, many of us are um, are feeling the weight of collapsing systems, not just here in the U.S. but all over the world. Um, and uh, I was recently in a conversation where um, someone was helping me to understand what it looks like to be living in apocalyptic times, right? And um, and gave me uh, some new new language around it that um, that name that apocalypses are when things are being revealed, right? Not necessarily when things are ending, right? And so for many of us who are in a space where um, where systems failures and oppression and um, and violence are being revealed, it can feel as though um, there are very few solutions. And so this, this space over the past two days has been a reminder, right, that we are the ones that we've been waiting for. We are the ones uh, that we need, right? Um, and, that, uh, and that I believe that we will win, right? Um, one of the major ways that, um, that we will win is by recognizing that our, our struggles are interconnected, right? Um, what happens here in the U.S. Um, has happened, will be happening, is happening in different parts of the world. What is happening in different parts of the world impacts us uh, here in the U.S. Um, and so our, our struggles need to be connected as well. And the conversation that we are going to be in today is going to highlight how that that is already true um, and how it can continue to be more true going forward. So this is a joyful space. This is a joyful space that we're in today. Um, we can hold grief and it's a joyful space. There's beautiful work happening and we're going to hear about it today. So um, uh, in the same conversation that I was in last week um, about uh, where I was learning more about um, how to talk about apocalypse, we we were also I was also learning that uh, this thing that my family does, being from Ghana, um, where you are required every morning to say good morning to every single relative that you have in the WhatsApp chat. I thought this was just a Ghanaian thing, but I'm learning that this is something that is required from <laughs> our peoples all over the world, right? And so um, for some of us, it is almost midnight, depending on where we are in the world. For some of us, we are just waking up. It is afternoon for some of us. My invitation to those of you who are joining us online is to is to greet us uh, in whatever way, whatever is the way of your people, right? Um, in Ghana, since it's, it's the afternoon, we would say majo, right? Um, which is good afternoon. Um, and I would just welcome you to introduce yourself and, and greet us in, in the language of your people, right? If you're from Detroit, greet us in the language of Detroit. <laughs> if you're from uh, Kenya, greet us in the language of Kenya. We want to hear from you um, and welcome you. Um, so let's talk about uh, let's talk about where we're going to go today. So um, this session, um, is about um, uh, it's about global connections. It's about building sustainable movements internationally, um, and um, and so by the end of this session, what we're looking to do is um, is really lift up the idea that we can't talk about liberation without talking about it as a global issue, right? So all of our conversations are going to be rooted in that foundational idea. Um, we're going to hold space for the responsibility of U.S. movements, the responsibility that U.S. movements have for other movements, um, or, and to other movements, rather. Um, we, uh, we hope that today will be an entryway for people who have never really thought about their movement um, in a global context to, to start to envision that, 
Right. So that's part of the invitation today. And then um, we're going to allow space for folks within the global community to let us know what they need from us. Right. And also what they can offer. So that's that's what we're hoping to do um, between now and, uh, you know, about an hour and a half from now, just to let folks know we have a, a beautiful panel. You're going to be very uh, both aesthetically impressed and um, impressed by what they have to say um, today. And some some folks will be rotating off, but we're going to we're going to hear from everyone. We're really looking forward to that. We encourage you to drop your questions um, in the chat. Um, and um, and I'm gonna just let you know who's gonna be with us today. I also just realized I didn't let you know who I am. My name is Trish. <laughs> I am Trish Adebiat Shum, uh, and um, I'm the Senior Director of Leadership Research and Practice for the Robert Sterling Clark Foundation. We fund um, organizing and leadership development here in New York City um, for with a focus on building a vibrant, safe, livable, and just New York City that's powered by the diverse array of, array of people who call this place home. Um, and I'm also um, a very proud a member of the Liberatory Leadership Partnership, who, along with the, uh, the Center for Third World Organizing, is hosting this conference. So that's me. Um, in a moment, you're going to hear from, uh, from this glorious panel that we have here. Uh, you're going to hear from Napo Masciano, uh, Masciani, who is currently the artistic director um, at, uh, at Performing uh, Arts Center of the Free State, State, State and the Managing Director, the Managing of, director of Productions, of productions in, Africa. in South Africa. Um, you're going to hear um, from, 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 from Brian, Brian Kamadzi, who is a who researcher, is a researcher um, at Trade Unions for Energy Democracy, Democracy at the City University, at University, of, University of, New of New York, and a research and consultant, consultant at the Institute, Institute for, for Economic for Justice in Johannesburg, Johannesburg South Africa. South Africa. Um, you're going to hear from Sen Young Yang, who is the political director at Grassroots Global Justice Alliance. Justice Alliance. Uh, we're also uh, not. We're also going to have the pleasure of Siri Brown. Siri Brown, Brown. Who's an educator, an educator, with global, with academics, with global academics, um, and, um, last but and last but not least, we're going to hear from, from, um, from um, the incredible, um, the incredible artist, uh, artist uh, Sister Regina uh, Calloway. Sister Regina Calloway who goes by Khalifa. Goes by Khalifa. Um, and um, uh, and is, a uh, is the cultural curator, for curator at, and for Enzio Khalifa. Is that how we pronounce it? How we pronounce it when you introduce yourself? When you introduce yourself. Thank you so much for being here and for all the wisdom you're going to share today and welcome. Um, Napo, um, we would love to hear from you. So what is your name, your pronouns, your role in the movement? And then um, we would love to hear what movement or movement leader who is not from your country has been a source of inspiration for you. Good evening to everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Trish. Uh, I'm so honored to be part of this panel. As you said, my name is Napo Mashiani, and I am a theater maker, a storyteller, poet, uh, and cultural activist. But more than anything, I am made of a movement that uh, was strongly inspired by protest theater because I was born in the 70s and I was there during apartheid. And one day we woke up and we were told that South Africa is free, there's democracy, and all the people who have been exiled came back, and all the people who were in prison or who were political prisoners were released. Um, so I'm part of the tribe of transformation. I'm made of both worlds, you know, where I grew up, where I wasn't allowed to enter certain spaces, to use certain things. I lived it, I breathed it. Um, so it's my grandmother, my mother, and all the people in my lineage. Um, and yet I'm part of transformation and change. Um, but protest theater is what made me, I knew heads on as, as a creative, as a storyteller, walking into a drama school that along Elizabethan and Western uh, theater history, there was a history that had been erased and languages that were not documented of my people. And I stood very strong on that. That's what I'm passionate about. That's the movement I'm in. Who outside um, my country inspires me? It's a difficult one. You know, I grew up with um, few points of references and the biggest points of reference point of reference for me is Winnie Matikzela Mandela, her fearlessness, her unapologetic um, spirit, um, you know, and I got an opportunity not just to, you know, to engage with her, but to celebrate her when she was alive. All of us cried when she passed away because she was a replica and a symbolic figure of what our grandmothers and mothers were not able to do what they were doing, you know, in, in the kitchen when they are cooking or, or sisters when they are plating hair, um, but she did it 
unapologetically in a public platform. And when she passed away, all of us said that she, she did not die, she multiplied. So we are replica and I'm the replica and tribe of Winnie Mandela. Thank you. Thank you so much, Napo. Brian, welcome, same question. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Brian Kamanze. I go by he, him. Uh, I'm a researcher at, at Trade Unions for Energy Democracy. Thanks for the introduction. And if I think about role in the movement, uh, to be honest, you know, I did not grow up in Napo, South Africa. I'm also from South Africa. I uh, was born in 1990, so I was at the at the cusp of democracy and also, you know, came into adulthood in, in the midst of some of the biggest failings. Um, I studied to, I went to a public school, I studied, uh, had an opportunity to study engineering and was funded by the government to do so, and entered a state company that was deeply racist, a state research company that was deeply racist, tried, bounced around the private sector and, and civil society trying to find a place to do positive work, because in my simplified mind, simply doing, completing your studies well meant ne that you necessarily would be able to contribute positively to the country and the country was in a positive turn rainbow nation all the terms that people might uh, associate uh, with south africa maybe 10 years ago um, and just time and time again i found that that wasn't true uh, from you know segregated lunch halls in the university um to just blatant office racism and i started to question more things there were massive student and worker protests in 2015 to 2019 and i got involved in that i actually met uh, Trish at some point in, in, in that in that band and uh, had the opportunity to see and learn a little bit more about the world. And, and I think um, I came to understand two things. One, about the importance of a broader understanding of education and that even though I had an opportunity and supported by the public system to study so much, I knew actually very little about who I was and why um, my family, people I know, my friends are in different situations and why our situation seems so intra intractable. So I learned that we have to think differently about education and that uh, I, you know it's very important that we also know what we don't know. And unfortunately, most of what we don't know is about each other. Um, I also um, came to understand that it's important for you to ensure that you're able to use your skills to very consciously fight against hegemony and that the reason why inequality exists is for very intentional purposes. And so you have to be very intentional. You have to take as seriously the task of liberation as you do every other part of your life. So I still feel very much part of that journey. You know, I, I a research and I support trade unions who are negotiating on the energy transition. Climate change is a very important issue. Um, but I accept that there are big tensions and contradictions in that. And I choose to work with trade unions and worker movements because, um, you know, at the moment, in South Africa, South Africa is an economy that is mainly fueled by fossil fuels. Uh, and most of the workers who work in that space are black and working class. And so there are, there are complexities with moving away from fossil fuels. And I'm interested in that because the, the development of that industry has also helped make South Africa the unequal place that it is. And so I want to be part of, uh, of making something different. And, and, and I appreciate that 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 has global resonance. Um, in terms of somebody who's inspired me outside of my country, I think you know you gave a, a very beautiful introduction and thinking about decolonization has been coming up a lot as a term. And you know I know it's been appropriated a lot by the universities and hollowed out of its meaning. But I think about um, Kwame Nkrumah and the moment uh, of independence after World War II as creating an opportunity for a new world. It seems so far away now. Um, but really thinking about, he had a formulation which I really love. He said, decolonization is collective self-reliance plus self-determination. So for me, what it really brings up and clarifies in my mind is that we need to fight for people to be able to self-determine themselves. They have full rights to be able to self-determine their own communities. But also there's an, there is a, a, an important cultural and economic element, this collective self-reliance, and that we need to be able to, to feed ourselves. We need to be able to have energy. We need to be able to have access to water. And, and there's some, I think sometimes it's very difficult to hold those two things together. We're either talking about political rights, like being denied the right to vote, or you're talking about like water issues or electricity issues in your country. But these two are very connected. 
so I think, you know, I, I think about somebody like Kwame Nkrumah as being somebody who dared to dream and to dream of a world that was completely upside down. Um, whereas, you know, today it's almost, it's it, the implicit expectation is that the world will always look as it is and Africa will always be in the position it is. Uh, but if Africa changes, the whole world will too. And so, you know, I, I, I want to be a part of that. I mean, if that's just your introduction, Brian, I can't wait to hear <laughs> um, so much more when we get into it. Um, yes, daring to dream of a world that's completely upside down. Let's keep going there. Um, first, let's let's continue with the introductions. Uh, Sun Young, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Who are you? Who inspires you? I have a hard act to follow <laughs> previous to um, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, or have you eaten yet, um, which is my cultural tradition of saying we care. Um, my name is Sun Young Yang. Uh, I am the political director at the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, which is a national alliance based in the United States of more than 60 grassroots uh, social justice organizations um, across the country. And we are specifically an alliance that is trying to build, bring together uh, grassroots sector movement leaders to envision a feminist anti-racist and regenerative economy uh, in um, collaboration and in solidarity with our international social movement allies who are also doing mass uh, base building work and mass work in general. Um, and um, I go by Shide, and I am currently residing in the unceded territory of the Lenape people in Trenton, New Jersey. Um, I, um, my heritage actually is um, uh, Korean. Um, I come from a line of, you know, um, resistance fighters and liberation movement folks, some of my ancestors who fought in, in the 1920s to, um, you know, free our, our people from uh, colonization by the Japanese imperialists. Um, and um, to this day, I think we are living a lot of the legacy and the legacy of colonization that's still dividing the country, thanks to the United States. Um, so this moment seems um, really important for all folks um, who are living or have lived in occupation um, and genocide. Um, my role specifically in the movement is uh, to be a bridger and first and foremost, an organizer, um, a conscious organizer who, um, you know, should be <laughs> is tasked to actually lead um, political education and political formation. Um, um, I am working on right now with my organization to, to figure out what does it mean to develop um, the next generation of conscious organizers who are using a transformative, transformative organizing model that brings both ideology and strategy and a deep love for mass base building for our people um, to come in to uh, fight for liberation in the long run. Um, and so that is the task that I have. And uh, I also wanted to share that, you know, I came into the movement um, through actually um, Black civil rights and national liberation leaders, um, folks who really brought um, a multiracial, like young generation of organizers and trained them um, in, in the tradition. And it was actually through the Black liberation movement that I got to find out about my own people's struggle um, as somebody who was living in the United States, disconnected from my own um, people's history. So I'm really grateful for um, just being in the space, um, but as well as um, many of my mentors who brought me into the US movement um, were um, Black liberation um, elders um, and organizers. Um, so in that line, um, there are several folks um, because our movements, even nationally, are actually internationalists, right? Um, so two folks that <laughs> I'm cheating uh, that inspire me is one is Berta Cáceres, um, the uh, land defender uh, and water defender who was martyred 
in Honduras, um, but we're fighting um, to not only stop the the, the multinational corporations um, from taking over and polluting their the rivers, their sacred rivers, but actually broad whole ethos and a training of of of, of feminist care and feminist political decolonial formation for the people. And her gift is has inspired many folks across the globe to continue to um, continue to train our people and decolonize and, and decolonization popular education. Um, as well as General Baker and Miriam Kramer Baker um, of WIF, who founded Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement and the League of Revolutionary um, Black Workers, um, who I actually re recently got to meet. So I'm, I'm super, super inspired by all the elders and ancestors that, that have been around. Thank you so much, Sun Young. And I want to recognize that you are um, currently in the midst of um, uh, holding, as along with GGJ, holding lots of rapid response in this moment, too. And so um, we want to recognize and thank you for that and know that your name will be spoken, too, um, by folks that come after you as someone who um, is an inspiration. Thank you for your work, all of you on this panel. I want to name that, too. Um, Siri Brown, I'm coming to you. <laughs> We'd love for you to introduce yourself. Thank you, Trisha, and greetings to everyone. Thank you for joining us in this conversation. My name is Siri Brown. I'm a liberatory educator and part of the Black Studies Movement. I always say the second generation of the Black Studies Movement. Um, and uh, the aim of what myself and my colleagues and comrades do is uh, shift the consciousness of youth in three critical ways. Uh, one is to replace any false identity with a true identity of who we are as African people, uh, knowledge of our past and present, etc. Another is for us to um, help us uh, understand how to reject the false constructs of what it means to be African, what it means to be Black, um, and also the third is to help young people, um, you know, with their forward thinking and politicizing and understanding a politicized, uh, in a politicized way, uh, self, community, uh, country, and of course the world, especially the black world. Um, this, my work comes out of my own experience being a financial aid, you know, uh, baby and finding my way to college and um, and finding college through uh, being a homeless youth. And uh, what college provided was housing, food, shelter, <laughs> financial aid, and a level of consciousness raising that has impacted the rest of my life. So as a freshman 18, when I took uh, a black studies course, I just, my mind was blown. And I continued on with ethnic studies and women's studies um, and, um, uh, along the way, I found a flyer that that was um, a study abroad program based on adventure. They called it like, uh, you know, some kind of adventure in Ecuador and Costa Rica. And with my financial aid, I was able to go. I had never left the country before, and it was the most profound learning experience in terms of globalizing my consciousness and politicizing my consciousness in a global way that it forever stuck with me. I learned more in that trip than probably the other four years of college. So when I ended up um, becoming um, an educator myself, this is sort of the root of, of, of how I look at what education can do to the minds of young people. Um, and so I started Black Consciousness Raising Tours, uh, we call them, uh, through our Black Studies Department uh, about 20 years ago at this point. And we've taken thousands of young uh, African-Americans and Latinx students abroad to Cuba, Jamaica, Brazil, Belize, Ghana, South Africa, um, very particular uh, places, countries, spaces where the Black consciousness has um, and the Black conscious movements are very unique and have uh, real poignant successes and challenges in a real politicized environment and a strong cultural identity. Um, from that, I um, broke off and founded um, Global Academics. And we take, we do exactly what I've been talking about. We take youth of color abroad, preferably those who have never had a passport. As you know, many of our young people are not able to even leave the neighborhood, uh, let alone um, the country. Um, and um, 
For example, we just finished uh, a Black Girls uh, Institute in Salvador Bahia, Brazil, a leadership institute this past summer. And the picture behind me is of our young people who participated in the Black Feminist March that happens every July in Salvador. So, uh, so the tours are very very particular in, um, in meeting, you know, the conscious people, the movement people, the artists, the creators, the, you know, uh, when we, when we go to these countries so that, so that young people can make those connections, you know, those global kinds of connections and compare and contrast and learn about how do they organize in Salvador Bahia? How do people organize in Jamaica? How do they organize in South Africa? What can we learn in exchange from this? Um, and uh, take back that resonates and share with uh, the young people and the and the not so and the seasoned organizers in the countries that we visit. Um, and last, uh, I am uh, really happy to hear Brian bring up uh, Kwame Nkrumah. I'm a strong Garveyite, and without Garvey uh, and his ideas and his work, his Pan African work. Um, and the influence they had on African liberation movements as well as Black movements in the U.S. Um, so I'll, I'll lift him up as being continuing to be a very inspirational leader and organizer uh, of, of global mass movements uh, in the past. And he still uh, his work and words, you know, and philosophy still impact so many of us today. Thank you so much. I'm already uh, feeling such deep inspiration, just even hearing the names of these movement leaders uh, in this space. And I add all of you um, to that list. Um, so last but not least, we we would love to hear from you, Sister Khalifa. Um, who are you? Who inspires you? Mm -hmm. I first want to give thanks and um, just for being present in my purpose right here living liberation with all of you in alignment. And um, inside of that, I must salute Dr. Siri Brown is the legacy for the trailblaze, legacy that she has burned in the Bay Area reflects throughout my family about two to three generations from oh uh, my Dr. Gosh. Wesley, who is my elder cousin and to uh, many of my cousins who've gone to merit and speak your name in my grandmother's house. And I celebrate that hailing from San Jose State University's then Afro-American Studies Department under the chair of Dr. Milner and the small boy, Dr. Carlene Young and, and all of that. So this is so God for me as the ancestors are speaking because this morning in my meditation, they said, lift up your artistry and, and all of that will be encompassed in your journey. And so many times it is underestimated about the powerful transformation agents that we are as artists. And even so, if I were to say, oh, I'm a dancer or I dance, it has a different connotation and meaning this day. But if you're born in Oakland, California, in the cusp of the civil rights movement and the black power movement, you know that dance is movement. You know dance is warriorship. You know that dance is transformation. Right, it is cultivation, it is invoking the ancestors. And also um, in the wake of that, so much of my childhood were in supplemental uh, educational opportunities by way of my community. And we understand community as being commune plus unity, those who you commune in unity with. And so with that, um, I've started a organization or a, I'm gonna say a dance ritualist society called Enzo Khalifa. Enzo, which is Kikongo for sacred home, sacred house, where we align and um, we convene upon things that transform the community and we deal with our matters, taking um, advice from our elders, from our ancestors and from surveying our communities. Uh, we, we work together to transform it to a better place. And Khalifa was a um, adoration name by way of my father who wanted me to know that the experience of Africans in the United States did not start with slavery, that there were Africans here in the Americas long before such um, an experience. And so I grew up knowing about who Queen Khalifa is and was and, and who she is for me. And so um, I reflect that. And inside of that, just overstanding that 
there is the indigenous presence and the dynamic quality of the Maya and the African then, which I absolutely love. And so that's in turn being impacted by that. I traveled to the Yucatan. It's one of my favorite places to be to actually teach and actually to forward the scholarly trek um, that was blazing through San Jose State University to learn about worldview. Welch and Chung, we were taught that German word. And I remember um, thinking, Dr. Small, why are you teaching us this word? Well, she want to, wanted to install in us a worldview as um, African ancestor agents. And inside of that, I can hearken upon my mother saying, yes, you were born here in Oakland, California, the United States and raised by double Louisiana folk, but you are a citizen of the world. And so taking those seeds in and those being deeply entrenched, I went on my own sojourn to see how we reflected in the world and wanted to establish kinship on a foundational level, knowing that we weren't just bonded by the land, but by blood. And what are those memories that we share with one another um, that can we can teach each other in wisdom to transform our space, our place, and the faces that are around us. So that is what I do through Enzo Khalifa. Um, it started as Enzo Khalifa Dance Work, where dance moves and spirit lives, but it now is a curatorial agency and also um, an agency of relief and revival. <laughs> and especially has had to transform in the wake of the pandemic and in the wake of our elders moving and transitioning and also um, I also lift up to sacred world traditions, the traditions where the wisdom of our mothers will never die and has a lot to do with holistic motherhood for midwifery and also rites of passage for our young girls. So these are the, um, I would say the vessels that I carry with me and am in dialogue with wherever I travel. My dance has afforded me to travel to places that will reflect my ancestral lineage as I am a genealogist as well. And my genealogist, my genealogy I use as a divining tool. And that is to crack codes of my ancestry and also to bring in when I'm having a dialogue in the community, whether it's through a trial, trial or a, a story, I invoke conversations with folks about their story. And then we get into a dialogue about family, what that looks like for us, how we're re reimagining it. And then I go into introducing them to ways to understand the footsteps of their ancestors so that they can draw inspiration and not to be disconnected and kinship, be back in kinship, reclaiming kinship once again. I will say that some of my most dynamic influences in the global world has been um, in Salvador da Bahia, Brazil. I consider it like my second home. And um, I traveled there back in 94 and my first uh, intention was to meet Condomble priestesses, and one of the most remarked ones that impacted my life was my, my Stella Gia Chosi um, of Ache Leo Pofonja in Salvador Bahia, Brazil, and um, God rest his soul. I say this because um, at a time where there was a lot of conversation and dialogue about syncretism, that particular word, and the diaspora spiritual traditions, they were saying, no, we are as we are as Europe, Yoruba people in this land and we retain the traditional ways and rights of our folks as it exists in Africa to be held true. And so I, I drew strength from that and it was an empowering agency for me as an African born in the United States. And to that, I add to that uh, Chief Nike uh, Davies Okundayu out of Lagos, Nigeria, who with her art, uh, particularly what we know as Indigo, she calls, it is called Adira in Nigeria. And she teaches uh, children disadvantaged who are not exposed to certain resources in her areas about the arts and social entrepreneurship. And, um, and has an over 8,000 uh, item collection, artifact collection, and is highly revered and renowned throughout the world. In fact, her collection is said to arrive in Atlanta uh, and partnering with the church, a new birth missionary Baptist church. And, and she's going to install art there and teach about the culture. And I'm particularly excited. So these are the things that reflect in my life and impact my life as so. And I find a synergy in bringing it all um, um, as tools and instruments of change. And I say transformation. 
And so it would behoove me, and I'm so grateful to my ancestors and to the, each of you so much to be here and um, in purpose and on purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Khalifa. You are definitely showing up in purpose and on purpose. Uh, <laughs> we see you and we appreciate you. Um, that uh, that introduction was just so full and rich, um, and I was I was struck by how um, how easily folks around this uh, virtual table were able to name um, how they were influenced and taught and connected to um, to global movements, right? Um, it just felt so like seamless, right? And, and I think I was struck by it because it is not the norm in the movement spaces that I'm in. Um, you know, the United States is its own um, beast, as we sometimes say, and it can be really easy for us to think that what's happening here is the worst thing that's happening anywhere. And what we learn here and figure out here is the best thing that people are learning and figuring out everywhere, right? So, um, so those of us around this virtual table know that there's much more to that story. And one of the things that we, um, I'm just curious about what, what sort of creates that dynamic, right? What, what is getting in the way of US movements really being able to connect our issues and our resistance globally, right? What, what keeps this kind of conversation from being the norm in our movement spaces here in the US. So I'd love to hear folks speak to that question. Um, and I see you nodding, Brian, so I'm gonna come to you first. Um, so I wonder if you can speak to that. Yeah, sure. And, you know, I, I consider myself a, a visitor here. So, you know, if I speak out of turn, uh, folks and comrades who've, who, who've grown up here, you can, you can call me to order and check me. But you know, I think that the first thing really is we have to just set aside what we already know. We already know that uh, the media plays such a strong role in how people understand themselves and their position in the world. We know that schools are failing children and that we know that a lot of efforts are being made by right-wing forces to even take the education system that is there and move it even further rightwards to remove references to, to black history, feminism, or, other, or many different types of issues. Now, I think it, what exists today is a very far cry away from what I think a whole range of different activists and movements had envisaged at the end of the civil rights movement about a different kind of society, about a different kind of relationship to the world that was about peace, that was about a different, uh, a, 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 a different global reconstruction, right? At the end of colonialism and, and see, also seeing oppressed groups within the United States as being very much a part of that fight against colonialism. I, so that is to say, you know, we have to acknowledge that these are, that approach has existed before and that there is nothing, you know, the people who live in the United States have had international contact and exposure forever. This is an occupied territory. Everybody comes from, almost everyone comes from somewhere else. Its relationships are absolutely important. They're important for the oppressors and they're important for the oppressed. The oppressors place a significant amount of resources and intention behind establishing military bases, trade agreements all over the world to reinforce their vision of what the world should look like. And we have to do the exact same thing, is that if we want a world that is, that is upside down and liberated, that we have to build the kind of relationships uh, throughout the world um, with people who, we, who resonate on our issues. And people, to some extent, that is already taking place. If you, you have water issues uh, in, in, in cities like Flint, Michigan, or in, in Jackson, Mississippi, you have some of those issues in South Africa as well. And activists in both places are aware of each other and sometimes talk with each other. But the only time you see that elevated to a campaign or to something more serious and sustained is when there's actually relationships. We see a lot of outpouring of support. Several people on this call here are actively engaged with issues on Palestine based in the United States, one of the, key, one of the world's foremost support, if not the world's foremost supporter of the state of Israel. The reason why that act, activism is, is exploding the way that, in, in such a public way that it is today is because of sustained relationships that exist. 
And so I want to say as, 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 a, as a visitor, as somebody who is also trying to participate in building some of those relationships, I want to say that we have to be intentional. What's getting in the way, people are aware. There are people from all over the world that are here. You know, Trish, you and I are sitting in New York City. It's one of the most international places in the world. So when people say, you know, that uh, America is so isolated, people cannot see beyond that. I'm like, I'm not really sure what you mean because there's Senegalese people down the street. There's the, they, you know, in the morning they get their food from Puerto Rican store. They order uh, Chinese food for lunch and maybe, you know, go dancing at a Cuban place later. That's the kind of life that people, so we have, to, we, are, we have to change some of the narrative, both at the social level and at the political level, we borrow from each other and we've been in community with each other for a long time. But that's not often how we speak when we re-represent our stories about the anti-apartheid movement or the civil rights movement. We don't often explain, we don't include about how much a part of the world we actually are. And also in a way, which sometimes can take the shine off of our story, how ordinary our struggles are. And there's actually a lot of power in being ordinary because you're not minorities, you're in fact, you're part of a global majority. Uh, our issues are so common and that is so horrible, but that is our greatest power. You know, so we need, we need an acknowledgement of, of, of our relationships, uh, sorry, of our common, common issues, which is there. And then we need intentionality with relationships. Yeah, so that's, that's what I think is needed. I love that. Um, Siri, I'm looking at you. I'd love to invite you to chime in on this too. Brian's talking about sustained relationships and you said so beautifully in your introduction. I mean, this is what you do, right? It's not just exposure, exposing people to these other places, but, but um, hoping to build community between folks in these other places. So I'm, I, I would invite you to talk about, you know, what's, what is getting in the way of U U.S. movements being able to connect and, and if you even want to start talking about what we can do to improve that. Sure, I'll chime in. I, um, I think that uh, what Brian's lifting up is very true. We're in this, this uh, the United States is a very multiracial, multiethnic, multicultural, you know, multi-country of origin um society but at the same time it's also uh, extremely like monolithic in a way because um for example um the the teaching or um acceptance of other languages within the educational system um is something that is still not really accepted it took a long time for the united states to even allow for bilingual education um, and so someone like Napa who says, oh, I speak nine languages in, in the United States, unless you're from or your family is from another country and you were raised in your household speaking that country, um, when you go to school, there's this monolithic kind of approach. I also think that uh, the United States, in the United States, that part of the broader culture um, can be very uh, US centered, you know, and so when people do go abroad, um, oftentimes it's a comparison to what happens in the United States, and there's not a lot of flexibility around thinking um, about the, the ways that other people move culturally, politically, et cetera. So although obviously the people listening and those of us here, that's not the case. But generally speaking, I think that there's, there's this, this um, shrouding of kind of ignorance on that level. And so um, if we, if indeed, you know, we're organizing and we're so bogged down. The United States is very good at that, bogging us down with so many um, battles to fight in our organizing um, and also in our personal lives that, um, that it can be easy for people to organize in that way as well and to, to not be mindful or take, uh, take note of the knowledge that they really already have about the fact that all movements have always been global movements. You know, my first protest and my first experience protesting was um, uh, against apartheid in South Africa. Most of the organizations that we rise up, that we hold up, the Black Panther Party, for example, since, you know, being from Oakland, uh, these are uh, organizations that had had international and global perspectives. Huey P. Newton actually wrote about that a lot. Um, and there were chapters many chapters outside of the United States as well. So I think that um, although it's there and, um, and certainly that's real, that we can still do a better job of making those connections. 
um, politically and also, you know, personally um, amongst each other's organizers and, uh, uh, and for our organizations to connect on the work. And that's very powerful to do that. Um, it's, it, you know, today it's probably easier to do than any other time because of platforms like what we're on, right? I mean, it's easier to connect globally, but um, the more that organizations are able to go, actually go abroad or to host people from abroad to come to their organizations and their meetings um, or to hold their annual meetings um, um, in another country, then uh, the better that it is, the better it is. Um, last, I'll say just very quickly is that um, you know, to, to learn by reading and being on Zoom and social media, okay, fine. But to learn by doing is much more powerful. It's obviously, it's not easy for the majority of people to, to be able to go abroad. Uh, but there are ways that we can make this happen uh, for our organizations and for our organizing politics. And I think that it should be a part of every mission because it, it helps us to understand that um, you know, people of color are obviously the global majority and politicized people of color are also the global majority. And the more that we can understand that in person as well, the better for our organizing. Yes. Um, I feel like there's a whole other panel about funding, uh, <laughs> international gatherings, right, um, as uh, as an organizing tool and a political um, tactic. Um, and yeah, we, we could have a whole session just on that, <laughs> the limitations and the, the importance of that. So thank you for lifting that up. Um, particularly because, uh, you know, this next question that I would love to get into is about um, is about what we need to learn from movements outside of the U.S. And and again, I I apologize that the framing here is like a little bit U.S. centric, but partially it's because we feel like that's that's the the area of focus in terms of who really needs to be um, kind of expanding our thinking around global connections. So um, so we're we're speaking to the U.S. folks right now. What what can movements outside of the U.S. Teach, uh, teach U.S. based movement uh, actors about advancing our campaigns for freedom and liberation in a global way, right? Um, Sun Young, Sun Young, I'm, I'm looking at you because this is what GGGA does, um, and I think does really well. So um, I'd love for you to to kick us off in speaking to this. Yeah, thank you, Trish. I think um, one of the biggest lessons that I've learned is that. Our imagination is a contested terrain in the society, right? Um, we are constantly fighting erasure we're const of our own history, of our you know history of resistance in, in in all levels, and and literally being isolated from the world. And so, um, our consciousness being a contested terrain, we have a hard time imagining what winning looks like, what mass scale um movement strategy all of that looks like and i think one of the the biggest gifts of being able to connect with social movements um across the globe especially in the global south is around um what it means to actually like win <laughs> and um in a mass scale inside the united states quite honestly the 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 level of winning that we've we've gone to was you know post-Civil War when Black Reconstruction happened. And we, we got to imagine, hey, what can democracy, what can a liberated society can really look like in that period until it was, you know, shut down and repressed, right? And so in, in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, across the globe, the movement is a movement of millions, of billions. And I think when we, GGJ, Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, take our members, our grassroots leaders here who are, you know, fighting the carceral system, who are, you know, trying to win electoral power in different states, et cetera, when we take them to Brazil or other places where literally social movement um, players are negotiating, have won governing power, have won popular power, um, their slogans, their vision is actually hegemonic, it really like shifts our, our 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 own grassroots leaders' ability to 
think about like how much growth and organizing that we have to do and what are the key lessons and strategies that come from those exchanges. I think another piece that we've learned a lot is that I, what um, Dr. Siri has said is that it, 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 it's, it's nice to be on social media to exchange. And actually we have a lot more privileges than our ancestors did um, in the forties and the fifties and the sixties. Now we have social media, we have information on the tip of our hands, but it's not until you rub elbows, you march together, you eat and you break bread that true relationship happens. And many of our international allies have told us, hey, I did not realize, I did not know the level of resistance and, and fighting and the, the level of exploitation and oppression that BIPOC folks, for example, face inside the United States. But now I understand there's a global South within, within the global North, right? And, and similarly, likewise, our members have gone and understood what exploitation that we're experiencing here and what many of colon, colonized nations, uh, global South are actually going through super exploitation. And despite those conditions, they are mobilizing, organizing long-term change and movements of the millions. And like that, learning that by being there and, and exchanging and building um, and building trust has been uh, a critical piece of lesson that we've 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 been able to bring back. And so our horizon for our membership has gone from not just from Oakland or from Trenton or in Philadelphia, but starting to be able to connect, hey, Detroit, we've had water shutdowns and our Palestinian um, mothers and allies have written saying like, we know exactly, you know, the, the, the countless um, struggles that the black community is facing in Detroit and in Flint because we're, we're, we're facing this similar conditions under Israeli occupation who have destroyed our water system. And here's, here's the information, here's, you know, how we express solidarity. Um, and so those connections um, have been critical um, in giving us a new imagination and new hope that we're not alone and giving us specific lessons and strategy and tactics of how we, how we move our, our fight forward. I love that so much, right? I really, I was expecting the um, exchange of tactics, you know, but I love that you started with the fact that um, that these other movements are sources of imagination. They expand our imagination, not just about like how to creatively resist, but what it looks like when we win, right? Um, thank you for, for painting that beautiful picture. And Napo, I would love for you to add to that. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm just thinking about um, so, so much that we've been saying, around, uh, you know, um, in this platform and, and the whole concept of resistance and activism um, and how it has given birth to artism, the con you know, the concept of um, using your art, um, you know, uh, and, and the, the whole notion of, which is one of my biggest um, tagline from page to stage, word of mouth. And I say this because in the global sense, you know, everybody has access. And I think Brian can, you know, uh, attest to the fact that in a global sense, you know, it's the elite that has access to internet, that has uh, access to media platforms. The majority of people, especially in, in, in South Africa and Africa as a continent are people who don't have electricity, uh, to have a, a, a you know a, a digital device is luxury, uh, you know you know a roof over your head is more important than being connected, uh, and we've seen how that has disadvantaged a lot of young people living during you know, COVID, uh, you know, when, you know, everything was online, that the majority of young people couldn't access education and they were deprived of information and advancing. But there's something very strong, um, Trish, about um, artism, you know, um, you know, the art of activism, where you're using words, you're using your dance, you're using song, you're using movement, you're using poetry, you're using a monologue, you're storytelling um, around the fire, uh, and, and creating stages and, 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 you know, using every space as a platform, as an amplifier, as a microphone to really, really, you know, collectively take a stand. And I think one thing that um, we've been very good at in, in South Africa, even as far back as apartheid, but even beyond that, you know, even during colonization, even just passing stories, values, um, really, you know, orators, oral literature has always been through the, 
art form of us engaging and speaking and sharing information and making sure that that information, um, you know, through creods and, and, and royal bards and poets and singers and dancers and walking performers that people get access to information, but also they know when war is coming, they know uh, how the other tribe or ethnic group has won the war, but also the challenges that, you know, others have experienced, who died, who's alive, who won, who lost. So I think for me, you know, as a theater maker and a storyteller, I think it's very important for us in, in the global um, movement of, of, of learning and using tools that are connecting all of us. I also wanted to also talk about how, um, you know, in, 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 it also something that we very champion in terms of decolonizing. Um, you know, Brian, you spoke about decolonizing, like how, how you name things, how you give things names and how you call things what they are and you're not sugarcoating. You are not honoring silence at the expense of your peace. Uh, you speak out, you stand up and sometimes you're not able to do it through a digital device but you're able to do it in the platform um you know that is a conversation you know um in a space in a public space in a social space uh one of the things about south africa is that we sing when we go to war we sing when we are going to fight we sing when somebody loses their life we sing when somebody gives birth we sing when we name you but we also sing when we are sending you off to the other world and for me all this small aspects of what makes us Africans and that have forgotten. Um, I find that part of autism, in a sense, allows us to bring all these different issues of roads must fall, uh, hashtag me too movements. Um, you know, when, 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 when we're talking about black consciousness, we remember also black power. We also remember civil rights movement and how they feed into songs and spaces and movement. Um, and I also wanted to say, you know, um, one of the things that I've learned uh, as somebody who never experienced slavery and who has always been rooted in their own homeland, um, I knew that even if they were to change my name, even if they were to move me, they cannot um, kill and mute and silence the songs and the words of my people that are part of my DNA. So no matter where you, are, you uproot me and you throw me anywhere in the world, I carry within my DNA all these things that are always going to make sure that um, undocumented, um, you know, um, you know, experiences of my people, I carry through uh, those songs and those dance moves and those spiritual elements and rituals. And I think history has proven that it's right. Uh, you know, when you look at the diaspora, um, there's always that connection spiritually, politically, socially, economically, but also artistically. And at the end of the day, art becomes for me that strong tool of activism and resistance. Yes, artism, yes. Um, let's stay, let's stay on that tip. Sister Khalifa, is there anything you would add uh, or chime in with this question of, uh, yes. of what we, what we can be taught by moving on? Amandla! A way to... Amandla! A way to... Amandla! A way to... A way to... A way to... The hour is ours. <laughs> That's it, you know... That's the part. While you're all are speaking, Brian, Napu, and Sun Young. Oh my God, Sun Young! If my mother knew that we were sharing the same platform, she uh, she'd love you as a daughter and me extra because she's traveled to South Korea. She loves it immensely. So, absolutely. And um, so this is what I'm speaking of. Uh, is this that it's why we have to be global and connect and learn from our brethren and sistren um, abroad. And I wouldn't even say abroad. It's like what Napa was saying about DNA and that gets into blood memory. It, it makes us take the sojourn and, and take the quest because of the lineage from which we come from extends beyond, even though we see ourselves in body, there is a memory that's saying, go home, young woman, go home, young man. There is wisdom. There are seeds of knowledge there for you to align. And so, in our respective commissions, um, whether it is political or whether it's um, with uh, social justice or racial justice and, and or healing, uh, there are seeds of knowledge that are in our ancestries, one that we can learn from not just our own lineage, but our communal ancestors as well, those people who we meet along the way. And it's been to uh, my benefit, and I know it's, it's what's made the way I program and my leadership and 
the way I strategize is it's got a strong Congo foundation as my teacher, Tom Alonga Kaskaloy from was from Brazzaville, Congo. And I have many um, uncles and brethren from the community who's from DRC. And so when we come together in Mbongi, that is a, a political movement for uh, dealing with the matters of the community. And, and there is a, an eldership stratification and you learn about what those roles were are and why that is important and is not to be leveraged. It, it is a respective uh, sacred ancestral hierarchy. You know, oftentimes overshadowed and politicized by these other systemic ways for which um, has an underpinning of deep colonialistic, very dissonant ways of governing people who don't look like them especially on these lands. And so if, if we, we strive to liberate ourselves uh, from who we are and what we know, um, starting even in the 1500s on these lands, there are laws that are, con um, that are waged against that kind of action and are that kind of, um, to, to kind of like stifle, stifle the, the liberation and the movement or there is a war thrown on top of you uh, that invokes another nation that doesn't look like you out of scarcity to overtake you so that, you know, your ideas can be annihilated and you can be put in place. So this country has a very long legacy deeply rooted in its soil to do so. However, the benefit is, is that those are people who extend beyond these lands and their memory does too is why we're still here speaking of liberation. When I was in Salvador da Bahia, Brazil, and one of the reasons why it attracted me is specifically because they honored our heroes here in the United States um, in a time where um, black power or loving yourself as a black person was would either get you killed or persecuted or just um, silenced. They were celebrating us on their clock in a movement processing in the streets 3,000 strong. I needed to know who those people were and why they loved us and teach us so why we can love ourselves more and why who we are in this place matters. And that's um, that group is Ile Aye, whom I love. Um, and I traveled there in 94 and I still promote and exchange their ed educational pedagogy. And I'm always going to have my finger on the pulse of, about their matters as they do about us. And now there's vibrant cultural exchanges where they can even travel here, most recently led by Danda Daora, who is one of their oldest uh, members, I'm just saying as far as seasonally, who was able to live her dream and see that happen here in the United States in the, the empowerment of that, even transcending the um, universal timeout known as pandemic. It's critical that we're cultivating in those layers and um, in those dimensions because it's vital to our very lives. There is a top level of our community that's going fast and they're called the eldership, our elders. Um, and we must, and it's critical that we get them while they do have breath, we get their stories, we get their seeds, we get their strategies, we get their knowledge, we get all of that so that we don't have to feel lost and we're still connected. And so um, here, in this space, um, given the travels and the sojourn of the, each of you, I feel divinely connected. And I know that that's a greater power that supersedes any power that tries to come for us. So mm -hmm. we are living liberation in how we're communing and convening and speaking about this and activated by each other's uh, work and the connection and, and then just also the, pa um, the passion and the, and the purpose that aligns us. So I wanted to speak to that Mm -hmm. <laughs> because the globe is in this room turning and spinning, activating and, and affecting. And so I'm hoping everyone who's watching us is feeling it right here. Thank you, sister. I, I'm feeling it. I mean, <laughs> I think it would be hard not to after that testimony. Um, and, you know, Please forgive me, folks who are are chiming in. If it feels like I'm sort of like hammering in on a point, um, but I think what we're speaking to so beautifully here is the importance of these connections, right? So I'm going to hammer on it again <laughs> by with this next question, which is, 
what's at stake if we, um, not just here in the U.S., but the broader social justice movement, don't center global, global perspectives in our work? Right. So we're talking about all that's possible when we build these connections, when we center global global perspectives. But let's put a finer point on it. Right. What is at stake if we don't center global perspectives in our work? Um, and um, what would you say to organizations who are already you know, overwhelmed and struggling with their own um, work? you know, that, that they're not sort of looking to this global context. So help us understand what's at stake, why it's so important, why this needs to be prioritized. And again, I'm looking at you, Sun Young, and, and I wonder if we can start with you before, before we hear from other folks. Thank you, Trish. I like hammering it. <laughs> going deep. Yeah, we're going deep. Um, I think it, it's a question of basically what is your organization's strategy and vision for liberation? If your vision for liberation is within your own community, you know, I think that's great. And we don't, you don't fully understand the enemy, right? The, the systems, what, what we usually call the, the DNA, it's like a five strand DNA of the systems of oppression, right? Patriarchy, colonialism, white supremacy, um, all the pieces that are there that are actually our enemy or the system operates on a global level to undermine every local liberation struggle that there is. And so if our vision is liberation, we have it has to be liberation for all or nothing because what happens with the system is co-optation. We have seen many a times you know, our call for multiracial democracy. That, for example, is multiracial neoliberal democracy, right? That is, we're getting, some of us within the United States might be getting democracy on the bodies of other nations, of people who are uh, our ancestral lands. And so we have to be very clear, even when we make specific asks that, it could be easily co-opted unless it is a full-on liberatory vision that talks about how our struggle here is connected with struggles elsewhere. So, you know, the the, the neo the multiracial neoliberal democracy piece is is real, and we need to um, you know keep our eyes on the prize of what it is, and that's why the connection um, and expanding our strategy um, to be global is important. I, I just want to give one example, you know, it's, it's from the climate justice struggle, right? Um, in the 90s and early 2000s, when um, uh, carbon offsets and carbon trading was like being offered as like the panacea of, 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 of solution um, with the crisis that's happening around our planet. Um, Californians, um, in California, the governor was trying to pass um, uh, a, a, a climate justice bill that was 90% um, talking about carbon offsets and promised the environmental justice community, we will tax, uh, we, we, will, we, will, we will use the credits and revenue raised from that to provide relief for environmental justice communities inside California, right? And what we ended up connecting globally was that actually California was using um, carbon colonialism, buying and limiting entire tracts of Amazon um, forests, indigenous forests, to then claim credit. Um, and um, yeah, and while displacing and, and, and barring indigenous folks in the Amazon, um, different tribes from entering their own lands. And so there was a direct correlation of some kind of false carbon solution from California that, that was incentivized to benefit our communities within the US that then directly impacted um, our communities in the Amazon. But not only that, then continued a false model saying that we're actually addressing the climate crisis, but in, in, in fact, there were, none of the pollution was actually being reduced. And so those are the kinds of correlations that we're, we're making are the system operates globally and you know what they say oh that now, wow now we'll remove this problem from this community 
and they will export out and then bring the, uh, the problem right back to your front door. And so that that this is the level of kind of understanding our enemy and how they move tactically and strategically around the globe is necessary. Um, so, you know, yes, we're holding a lot, we're overwhelmed, but I do think that we can do our work and still have a global vision and not get hoodwinked basically by, by, uh, by, by the system. Oh, yes. And I love that, that visual of this, like the five strand DNA, right. That are, are, um, uh, that sort of like make up our oppression. <laughs> right. And, um, so not only having to keep our eyes on all of these different movements, but on all of these different threads that that perpetuate supremacy, right? And so, um, so yeah, just this idea that what's at stake is if if we pay so much attention to one, we're leaving ourselves vulnerable, we're leaving each other vulnerable, right? Um, uh, on all of those different levels, and so. Um, Yes, yes to that, um, and calling our attention to those things. Brian, what, what else is at stake, right? Um, you know, uh, Sun Young painted a pretty clear picture, and there's more, right? <laughs> and there's more that's at stake if we um, don't center this global context. What would you add to that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, when we started this call, um, lifting up what's happening between um, Israel and Palestine, and you know that case in particular makes me think about two things. One, there's a de there's a defensive side about this conversation, and an offensive one. And from the defensive side, you know what makes it possible for oppressive governments, imperialist regimes, to mow down people in the street to drop bombs, um, is partly also this idea that you know people's struggles are not connected that also some parts of the world are pathological and just prone to violence. And, you know, if, if there's war in Sudan, well, you know, it's Africa. So is that even a new story? Like that's a crude way of putting it, but it doesn't, it doesn't incite that feeling of there's a supreme injustice happening here because there are some pre-existing pathologies we have about different people. And we know that different people's, li people's lives weigh um, a different amount, unfortunately, today. So we know that, but we want things to be different, right? We know that a life in the DRC at the moment weighs less than a life in Germany, a death. But we want things to be different. So we don't simply just restate that and say, well, that's what it is. We say, no, well, we want, we need to build, we need to build relationships. We need to, whenever, you know, people are facing oppression, when we're building campaigns that are focused and, and, and responding to oppression, we use those relationships and elevate our campaigns to connect with glo global struggles and common issues. And we, when, when we reinforce this message that, unfortunately, because the way the world is structured, oppression and violence is ordinary. And our struggle is ordinary and common and shared, and we must uh, come together and overcome to, to reconstruct, right? But I think it's important when, we, when these issues are happening that we make them global, that we center a global conversation because it protects everybody. Because what we are actually seeing with Palestine is that if, if Israel is able to drop the, as many bombs as they have with impunity, if they're able to break international law so fragrantly, it means, well, for me as an ordinary, I'm not a legal scholar, but for me, it means that I don't, international law is bullshit. If it ever was a thing, it's bullshit. Because it means that if as long as you're powerful enough, you can do whatever you want. You know, and that's that's a scary thought for me as I think to the possibility of a Trump 2024 presidency, as I as I hear the the beating of drums of war uh, possibly between the U.S. and China. I think about in in South Africa how we've been framed, uh, uh, you know, for uh, trying to take a non-aligned position on the Russia-Ukraine conflict, been called all kinds of things by European European and North American governments, and the more that it's just okay for them to do this in spite of UN resolutions, in spite of things that maybe five or 10 years ago were not politically correct to say or do, the more we allow them to do this, let them do this, they shift the boundary, you know? Maybe, maybe uh, 
15 years ago, taking black history out of a high school school book, uh, a school classroom would have been something unimaginable or just crazy or in a, or in a, in a, in a TV show. And now it's today and people say, well, okay, that's Florida. That's not good enough. That's wrong. It's wrong in Florida. It's wrong in the United States. It's wrong in South Africa and it's wrong everywhere else in the world. It's actually wrong in a very ordinary global way because these, right, these lunatics exist everywhere. But they see a moment, they see a moment and we need to recognize what this moment is and, be, and think globally so that we can defend each other and protect each other. In terms of the offensive part, I, you know, especially there might be a lot of people working in civil society and, and not for profits. We have to always be on guard of, it's important for us to learn from each other, but not export models of justice because our situations are different. We cannot, there's a tendency to neatly package up people's struggles, platforms, demands, negotiations, and victories and say, well, why don't we just reproduce this in Kenya? Why don't we reproduce this in a community in Oakland? Completely decontextualized of what made it work or didn't work somewhere else. Again, Israel and Palestine. People say, well, you know, people correctly affirmed we support Palestine the way you supported uh, the anti-apartheid uh, movement in South Africa. But do you really want the future of Palestine to look like the future of South Africa, which has some of the same inequalities that people fought to get, lost their lives over in the anti-apartheid movement? No, in fact, the legacy of uh, the democratic period in South Africa is being deeply contested. And I would hope that the Palestinians, when they are eventually free, are able to think about freedom in a way that is not weighed down by the expectation that they need to reproduce a South African version of justice. They are their own place with their own history, their own demands and their own context. They can draw strength from us, but they don't need to have the baggage of our exported model of justice. You know, and I think that that's, we can share struggles, but we need to, we need to really guard against this tendency, especially from NGOs that there is a packaged way that justice looks and feels and smells a kind of way. All we have to do is find the right formula and the right toolkit, and then we can take it anywhere. And completely taking out the human subjective element. You know, people, people's history, there's been so much said today about DNA and history. People's specificities are so important. And we've got to respect that. And that's not a point, that's not actually a point of negative difference. That's actually the part that makes, at least for me, makes me want to learn more about other people. So I'm like, wow, actually, I couldn't have even thought about things the way that Sister Khalifa was saying. That's just not how my brain is wired. And my experiences are just not hers. And that doesn't, that, that doesn't mean I put a wall up between her and say, well, okay, well, you know, that's what it is. It's no, it's like, well, there's something gen potentially generative here. Maybe I can see further. Uh, and also maybe some of what comes out of the conversation isn't about me seeing but it's just about us being in community with each other and learning to live alongside each other and do something. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, I feel like I, I went to a, <laughs> a lot of different places, but you get what I'm trying to say. Brian, you were, you were leading us to the place where we're gonna end. This is, um, so you, uh, Spirit was taking you exactly where we needed to go. Thank you for that. And, um, so, uh, and, and I just want to name, folks might be noticing that the panel is, is uh, getting in increasingly more intimate. Um, you know, when, when you're working with folks who are um, in global struggle, they, they, they got meetings. And so um, we, uh, we want to name and appreciate um, our sister Sun Young, um, who had to hop, as well as our sister Siri, um, who also had to hop, both of whom um, dropped so much wisdom um and um and are still are still with us in spirit but had to move on to um to other meetings we are going to begin to to close with with sort of our final thoughts right so we um you know this last question which uh sun young and brian spoke to so beautifully was about what's at stake right like what what are we risking what's the danger of us not connecting our global struggles with us not centering a global context. Um, and then Brian, you just started to talk about well, where we need to go instead, right? And, and that's, that's where we want to, 
that's where we want to land. Let's go to that imagination place that um, that Sun Young uh, called us into, right? What is our vision for a global movement, right? Brian, I heard you say so clearly, it's not samifying our issues. It's not saying that what is in South Africa is what is in, in Palestine or should be, right? It's it's about saying that um, that our movement, acknowledging that our movements are global, right? But what does it actually look like for us to be moving together um, towards liberation? So, um, Napa, I'm gonna start with you with that very easy question, right? <laughs> what's no. Your, what's your, <laughs> What's your vision? That's not an easy question. You've been asking. What's your vision for a global movement? I want to hear from yeah. you. You know, Trisha, I just also want to take a moment. Um, honestly, I, I wish I wasn't even saying anything, just immersing myself in listening because, you know, when Brian was just talking, I was just like, oh my word, oh my word, yes, yes. You, you know, and, and there's a lot of moments when all, all of us, you know, engage and, and perhaps because I'm heavy and I'm going to connect it to you to your last question, because, you know, and yes, we're talking about, you know, uh, global liberation, but I also want to narrow it out that individual liberation is, is what allows people to understand and to have and to equip themselves with enough tools to collaboratively, collaboratively be part of a global uh, movement in terms of making sure that others get the liberation. You can only give and, and really probably lead a, liber a movement that is aspiring and inspire others to be liberated if you yourself are liberated. And I'm in a situation where I think I did in the beginning say that, you know, it's 60 years later and I'm in this institution that was built. And I think Trish, I shared this story in another platform, you were part of it, that, you know, it's a building that it, the, the, the energy, the spirit in that building, in that infrastructure and some, you know, so, so you realize that, you know, um, the struggle of our liberation is also so much embedded in infrastructures that we occupy, these concrete offices, the spaces that we are called in, you know, as Black women to clean and to lead. Um, and then you have to fight all these DNA systems that you have to create DNA solutions to. And there's so much at stake. And I'm saying this because this is where I am. You know, I'm heavy because, you know, like I said again in the beginning, when you've been first of everything because you are part of transformation, um, it's also a constant cry to want to liberate yourself um, and try to learn and, and acquire enough tools um, from different spaces. But what I think is very profound, what Brian, you said about not using a blanket approach, one blanket approach in things, you know, just because, you know, Trish did it a particular way. I think one is to look and get inspiration from that and, uh, you know, admire that or even critique that and analyze that and take within the methods or this, the, the, you know, the strategy and, 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 and the values that Trish used that resonates with your one. But also you take bricks and you have to build and rebuild and dismantle. And then you take what Regina says and you put a nail and I, I take what you say, Brian, and I put a window frame. It cannot just be a one blanket approach. And, and that's my biggest lesson. And I'm saying this because I don't have solutions because I'm still searching for that for myself. And it was what Brian said um, that really just hit me that, I, you know, perhaps in, 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 in creating this movement of change, uh, as part of transformation is not to use a blanket approach um, and, and not go out into the world. All I know is that I want to make sure as part of this battlefield that the next young black girl doesn't have to fight the same battles that I'm fighting. Her battles have to be completely different. I want to make sure that my sons fight, you know, differently and completely. So um, not using a blanket approach um, in this global liberation from an individual perspective. Beautiful. Um, let's hear from you, Sister Khalifa. I know we're getting close to time, but I, it just feels so important to, to hear each of you speak this vision for a global movement. What do you see? Okay. I. Um want to be intentional to take this breath right here, right now, so that that I have ingested these seeds of wisdom, the strategies, the fuel, and this power to um, be incorporated into my global liberation diet. 
So thank you, General O'Brien. I appreciate you. <laughs> thank you, Queen Apple. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Trish, so much for um, your foresight and your flow. And you're, you're like a river, like a, a mighty river. So thank you so much that you will would have co um, brought us together so that we could all flow and into a, a united purpose. And, and that's what I want to transcend this place from is the purpose. And so that before we can go forward, like my sister Nuffle said, we have to start and check in with our purpose and make sure it's the right assignment that we're on. Not because of what somebody else said or what other people think or the times how they're influencing us, but the right assignment. And so for that, we much tap into our superpowers around intuition, around gut, around faith, and then back to purpose. And then please take advantage of this season. This is the harvest to celebrate the fruits of your labor, critical, so that we're not just stomping and crushing over things and not appreciating the progress that we brought forth. Um, and we hold value with that. It's important we value our works and who we are in purpose. So I, I just want to thank each and every one of you and I salute your mighty crowns and your ancestors and and thank mine just for basically pushing me here <laughs> once a day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sister Khalifa. Um, uh, I'm honored to be called a river by you. <laughs> Um, and agree that we are, are lucky to be flanked with both a queen and a general. So we're going to give the general the last word. <laughs> um, if you want to claim that, that title, Brian. Um, no comment. Clo clo yeah, clo close us out by letting us know what you see. What's your vision yes. for, uh, for these global movements? Yes, Thank thanks, everyone. This has also been um, very lifting. It's been a, a heavy while, and it's just, it's, it's nice to be also to, to be forced to think about and answer these questions and and also be in dialogue and community with people who, whose brains are wired a different way because of their experiences. And, and I and I wish that a little bit more for the movement. That's part of my vision is that I feel that we are often there's a tendency to gravitate towards people who think and sound just like you, mm -hmm. uh, because at the moment, the risk of being incorrect or problematic is is deemed higher than actually crossing a bridge. Um, and that I think that's a very big barrier to make to strengthening movements and strengthening campaigns. You know? And so I, 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 I wish that we can, you know, open up space to be more vulnerable and more diverse and accept some of the messiness with that comes with that. And actually contend with the, you know, contend with the fact that our communities are not monolithic. You know, we we say it in every speech, but we often don't represent that in the way that um, campaigns are structured, leadership is chosen. Com you know, communities are not monolithic, and and our, our solutions are are often messy and not always perfect. And we should claim the right to tell different stories, to tell more complex stories. A lot has been said about art. We do that anyway. It's I think it's about pu pulling that from the margins and into the center. Um, and 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 bringing the human aspect a little bit more to the fore of, of movement with less like perfectly manicured frameworks and and uh, platforms from campaigns and just bringing people into it and that will also help i think get some of the the issues about destination out of the way as i'm firmly one of those people who believes that you know freedom is more about the process and the struggle than it is about a destination so it's less about the realization of the end of your campaign, and but more an acknowledgement about the fact that there are peoples and classes and ethnic groups and races of the world that have been that are systematically marginalized, and by all reasonable accounts, it's going to get worse for the at least the next ten years. So every issue has to be acknowledged in the broader context of that longer struggle. For some people, it's hundreds of years. Some people, it's thousands of years. You know, uh, but we are people in that struggle on a process and on a journey, and our movements need to reflect that, not just like single issues. Um, and so people are going to come at that from different vantage points, and, and sometimes they're going to be messy. But you know, the people 
we live in we live in our spaces and we have to we have to survive and i just hope that we we can move from survival up to something higher yes i mean mm. is there a better call than that a better call to action moving from survival to something higher um mm. you know this this entire conversation has been framed on the question of um of how do we build sustainable global movements? We heard from our sister Sun Young. We heard from Siri about um, you know having to have a deep political analysis, build global relationships that can be tapped in moments of crisis and in opportunity, creating these vision spaces. So we we talked about it at the macro level, um, but what I heard from each of you here as we were closing out, as you were naming your vision, is that really we want global movements that look and feel kind of like the last hour and a half, right? Um, <laughs> that bring in our full humanity, that are based on our connections and our love for each other, right? Where we break bread and we celebrate art, right? Where we speak from our hearts and remember that we're already connected, right? Um, where we're in this moment, right? As we're moving towards something that we hope is better. And so, um, so I, I hear you about wanting to practice, wanting to be in the practice of being in, um, in sustainable global movements right here, right now, and then doing that at scale. And I'm with you, I'm with you in that vision. Um, so I just wanna say thank you. Thank each of you for the way that you show up in movement. Um, thank you for taking a pause to, to um, vision and dream and call us um, to a higher place in this space. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined the conversation virtually um, and brought in your attention and wisdom. We hope that it was it was fruitful for you. I know it was for me. Um, thank you also to our folks at We and Goliath for facilitating the tech on this conversation. We see you and we appreciate you. So um, please, folks, this conference is not over. Join us back in uh, some of the other workshops, and we hope to see you um, at the end of the day for the closing. Thank you so much for your participation. We really appreciate you. See everybody. Thank you. Mm -hmm.